to do all my work at uh, I used to do all my work at super late at night and all of it. And uh, it turns out that when you have to when, when you turn it to an adult, that doesn't really work anymore. <laughs> Got to get up at eight o'clock in the morning and teach math. It's hard to stay up till three o'clock in the morning. All right. So today, uh, my plan is I want to talk about like a chapter that if you started to tangle with the homework already, you realize there's like a million things in section eleven point ten. It's like stuff to the gills with uh, with a. Uh, with stuff, right? There's like, there's so much, there's just so much going on in 1110. So I'm, we're not doing all of it. I'm gonna pick and choose my way through it because we don't have time to do every single thing. Um, but uh, yeah, so I try to keep the, the homework focused in that, in that regard. So we're gonna talk about uh, chapter 1110. I'm gonna ask you guys that, like those of you that have questions on the homework on 1110, let me get through the material first. Day and then tomorrow I'll be happy to answer any questions on all of that. Okay. Um, I did promise like different office hours this week leading up to the exam. So for me, uh, the best time to do that right now is I um, so like me. We're gonna do sort of an official office hour shift here. So I'm gonna try to run, I'm gonna run one tomorrow, and I'm gonna run it say from was it Tuesday tomorrow? So let's do uh Let's try for now. I, I I have a couple of choices. I can run it at 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. just prior to this class, and then we walk down here. I can also uh, I'll, I'll also pile one on at the end. I think I can do that. Um, can I on Wednesday? I'll have to do it on Wednesday in the afternoon. So this will be tomorrow's, and I'm actually going to try to run this in person. So if you cannot make this. Because you can only come on online. I'll have my computer open, but my office will be open as well. If a lot of people show up, we'll just go downstairs to the benches downstairs and the whiteboards by the faculty offices. Um, so my, my office is 25 through 10. My intention going forward is that we're going to do actual physical office hours. I just have to find times to do it that I get a lot of people in there. Um, actually, going forward, I'm going to try to shift this to 11. My, my general impression is that uh, 11 is the time that a lot of people have free. Um, uh, it's just that tomorrow I can't make that early. So if I do, I'll just open up Zoom and I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll let you know when I get to campus. So at the very least, will be this. If I can go before, I will be I'll, I'll put it up before. Good Wednesdays. Wednesdays, I'm gonna run. So Wednesday, I don't teach on Wednesday. So uh, Wednesday afternoon, I'm gonna be busy in the morning, but Wednesday afternoon, um, I can basically be in and I can run another two-hour break on Wednesday. Um, it's just a question of figuring out when on Wednesday we can actually do that. Right. So like for now, I mean it's like what do you need to do on Wednesdays? So a good a good range for Wednesday might be something like Wednesday. We could try to do something like 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Normally it won't be two hours. I'll be in my office, but I can try to do that's a suggestion for Wednesday. Um, and then we'll talk about like the later in the week stuff because almost nobody is coming to their earlier stuff, which means I need to figure out a way to like not take office hours away from the people that already have them, but to extend them so that more people come as the class starts to get more complicated. Okay. Um, what else? Yeah, so definitely. So tomorrow for sure, I'll run an office hour from, I say for sure, and let me check my calendar and make sure I'm not lying to you. Uh, Tuesday. Nope, should be possible. Okay. Um, and then uh, Wednesday for sure, I can do this. Yeah, and then we'll talk about reconfiguring the general schedule later. I'll, I'll, I'll also have one on Thursday. My usual office hours will still be held on Thursday, and um, I can probably do one Friday before the exam as well. All right, so uh, if you're having trouble, please come talk to me or drop by office hours or hit me up in Slack. There's a million ways to get in touch with me. I tend to respond right away because I've spent all night on computers basically. Catching up with the work I can't do during the day. Um, any questions about anything administrative I can answer before we go on? Any encouragement I can give you guys as your soul is being crushed by the weight of your classes? Keep going. 
Once we're through Taylor series, we can do integrals and derivatives again in a slightly more complicated context, but it will look a lot more like calculus too. All right. So that was a rousing cheer for that. Okay, so um, what I want to talk about today is sort of ideas that we can use around Taylor series. Because like I said, Taylor series are this sort of fundamental idea in working with functions is that you can replace functions with uh, with these power series, right? So remember last time we talked about Taylor series and uh, we decided that if a function has a Taylor series, it's of this form, f of x is equal to the sum n equals zero to infinity of the nth derivative of f evaluated at a over n factorial times x minus a to n. And the big deal of this is that this series replicates the behavior of f at every level of derivative, right? So this series basically recovers f by making sure it matches at a point all the derivatives of f. Right? And now f of a f prime of a times x minus a second derivative of f and so on. Okay. So I, I should point out that like there's a special case of this called the McLaurin series. I think last time I told you that McLaurin uh, wrote a textbook that popularized this particular uh, series. So if you take that and you put in a equals zero, so what, what McLaurin did was just put zero into that and got his own name thing. So McLaurin series just means that you're looking at this, f of zero, f prime of zero, x, f of derivative of zero, factorial x squared, so on. It just means the series is centered at zero. So I'm going to try to do another example of um, how to build one of these things. Just one more example of how to build one of these things. And I'm going to do it in a way that is slightly different than the way we did it last time. Um, because I'm going to shift. I'm going to, I think last time I wrote down the series for sine, but this time I'm going to do it centered at not zero. So the McLaurin series for sine we showed last time. This sine of x is equal to x minus x to the third over three factorial. It's like the odd powers of x divided by those factorials. So that's a Maclaurin series because it's not x minus anything, it's just x. And the way we did it was with that table method where we looked at derivatives and we plug numbers in. So we're going to do the same thing, but suppose I wanted to approximate sine somewhere else. I don't want the center of the series. The x is equal to zero. Suppose I want the center of the series to be something like x is equal to i over three. So that's my a value. That's going to change the coefficients of the power series because now I'm not just plugging in zero sign, I'm plugging in pi over three, which will change all the coefficients. Now it's still the case. That you're going to get this cyclic pattern because sine of x. Is a function that wraps back around on its own derivative, as you can tell, right? If f of x is the sine, f prime of x is cosine, second derivative is minus the sine, third derivative is minus the cosine, and so on. And then once you get to the fourth derivative, you're back to where you started. So understanding these coefficients is enough to get the whole pattern. You're getting this period four repetition. What the formula says is that you're supposed to know all of these derivatives with a plugged in. So I'm going to write down f of, this is where I get to test if you guys know your cubic circle. So this is one of these things where, you know, like, yeah, if you don't, it's very computationally useful not to have to sit down on an exam and draw yourself a unit circle and label it all up before you start looking at questions, right? So I, I recommend that you know at least sine and cosine at the basic angles. What is uh, what is f of pi over three? What's the sine of pi over three? 
I'm using the mathematician, the, the professor's yeah. trick, where somebody said the right answer and then I look at them skeptically to make the question. It, it, it is root three over two. It's not a nice trick, I know. You're supposed to be confident even if you're wrong. All right, F prime of pi over three. So the cosine of pi over three is, I mean, if you know this one, one half. One half. Minus root three over two. Wrap back around again. Yep. Sorry, can you go back to why x equals pi over three is your a value? Because I'm choosing it from the beginning. That's actually given to you as part of the problem. So the, the way the question will be written would be this: the Taylor series for x is equal to the sine of x and x is equal to pi over three. So that would be written into the problem. I have to give you the a value for you to do any of this. Okay, so what does that say our power series is? Notice I'm not even dealing with sigma notation here. I could just write this down. This one's actually easier to write without sigma notation. Um, sine of x is equal to, okay, so if you remember the Taylor series, the, 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 the symbolic Taylor series, you know that you're looking at f of a, f prime of a, x minus pi over, f of pi over three, F of pi over three plus F prime of pi over three plus minus pi over three. I'm just gonna write it out in symbols first and then substitute in the values that I found. Second derivative of F at pi over three divided by two factorial. Third derivative of pi over three over three factorial. And so on. If you know the symbolic version of this, you know exactly what you need to compute to plug in. Can't go wrong. If I made a mistake somewhere, let me know. Being given the A value means I know that these X minus pi over threes are gonna be running all over the place. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, if you substitute in, that means that do I know f over uh, f of pi over three was root three over two plus f prime one half really divided by one factorial times x minus pi over three plus minus root three over two over two factorial minus one half yeah. Do I care if you simplify that? No. Nope. Not at all. Just write it. As soon as you've written that down, you've written the Taylor series for me. You don't need to do anything else with it. It's just done. If you want to, I guess you can mash these things around and divide them by the factorials and simplify them, but I don't care about doing arithmetic on these things. Point is, as soon as you've written this down, You've written something down that you could approximate the sine with. But now what you're doing is you found a series for, the, uh, for sine that is centered. So what you're doing is you're building a function that extends from that point in both directions to approximate the sine instead of one that approximates from here. That's a neat, it's a useful thing to be able to do to slide around your point of approximation to where you actually need to work. Okay. That's why we do this. So basically every derivation of a power series from derivatives is going to follow these lines. So that generally what you would think of here is this is Taylor series from the definition. Right? What we did is we wrote down the definition of the power series. We computed the derivatives and we plugged them in. So we're not getting a series from another series. We're using the definition of the Taylor series. All of this is a power series from the definition. What is left to do? 
I got one step left, one really important step left. I told you that sine is equal to that function. So what's left? Is that enough when I write a power series down? I mean, you could do it with sigma notation. I mean, if you're going to do it with sigma notation, you'd do something like this. So if you're interested in sigma notation, this would be equal to something like Easiest way to write in sigma notation is actually to split it up into two series, one with threes and one with one halves. And so you could write it as something like the sum to many equals zero to infinity of all these even terms, right? So the zero term and the x squared term and the x to the four term all have these root three over twos inside. I think you end up with root three over two times minus one to the n times x to the two n over 2n factorial plus some n equals 0 to infinity of 1 half times minus 1 to the n times x to the 2n plus 1 over. You just cut it up, right? The root 3 over 2 terms into 1, the um, terms that only have the one halves inside. So like the first power term and the third power term and the fifth power term. So that'd be one way to do it, right? Is you could apportion these things out like this. You could write it as two series. Now I'm only allowed to do that if those series converge. So the big question that's left is where does this converge? When you write a power series down, you have to tell me not only what the formula is, but what the radius of convergence is. You have to tell me what the R value is. So what, what, what do I have to do? What's left? To find R, what do I use? What tool? I do something. How do I find radius of convergence? Ratio test, right? Every time we've done this, you use the ratio test. So I'm just going to tell you that if you apply the ratio test here, you end up with R is equal to this converges for every value in that. Now, for those of you that are already familiar, read ahead or worked ahead in the in the um, in the chapter, you should look at this that this is at x is equal to pi over three. That that's the a value of the series. This should actually remind you of a cosine plus a sine. If you know the Taylor series for sine and cosine, this is the Taylor series for a cosine. And that's the Taylor series for a sine. What's going on there? So one of the more important things that they never teach you anywhere is that uh, this is an aside for uh, like this really important fact. I'm just going to mention it now. It may be proved in one of your future classes, but this you can think of this as being a phase shift. You're phase shifting sine over by pi over three units. And any phase shifted sine or cosine is a sum of a sine and a cosine function. So if you ever write, so one of the, the most startling facts in science is that the sine of x plus some phase shift is equal to a linear combination sine and cosine. So you write a phase shifted sine as a combination with regular sine. I, this is not going to be used in here. It's just interesting that it falls out of this power series structure. Are you doing this test If you were, if I gave you this question, which I wouldn't, the way that you would build the rate, because there's two series to check, right? But the way that you would actually do this with the ratio test would be you would compute separately. Having written it like this, you would separately compute the limit as n goes to infinity of root three over two. Uh, x to the 2n plus 2 divided by 2n plus 2 factorial times 2n factorial over root 3 over 2 x to the 2n. And when you compute that limit, um, the factorial dominates the x, and you just get, I mean, there's an extra 2n plus 1 and 2n plus 2 in here. This limit is just 0, which is always less than 1. That's for that series. Yeah. So this series has infinite radius of convergence. 
that series has infinite radius of convergence. And when you combine series, you have to use the most restrictive radii for both of them together. Since this has R is equal to infinity, and this has R is equal to infinity. When you're mixing series, you have to make sure they're both sensical. But you would use the right. You would, and this is why I wouldn't give you a question like this on an exam, right? Because I don't, I mean, testing you once on the ratio test is enough. I don't need to test you the same thing twice. You, you, you absolutely have to be able to do that. Yeah. Not just ratio test, but writing it into the notation. I mean, writing a series into sigma notation is a really useful skill. It's not necessary, but it's really, really useful because it makes your work faster and more accurate. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but having long blown out polynomials to work with makes me much more likely to make mistakes. And if I have one term in a sigma notation, I just have to manipulate once. Okay, so before we get into um, the various manipulations that we're going to talk about. I want to write down some series that I absolutely insist that you have memorized. Insist. So there's about eight series that are in very, very, very common usage. In four of them, it is absolutely imperative that you have them memorized, as well as their radius of convergence. So which ones should you know? Which ones to memorize? Unsurprisingly, it's going to be the power series of the most common calculus functions. Those of you that already know these, you can test yourself. So, one over one minus x is one we've already seen a bunch in geometric series. One over one minus x is equal to the easiest possible power series, x to the n. One plus x plus x squared, and so on. Here, the radius of convergence is one. When I say r, I mean that determines. How far in other direction, any direction you would go from zero. So r is equal to one means that you're allowed to put in these numbers for x. Sine of x is minus one to the n x to the two n plus one two n plus one factorial. And I want you to be careful here because two n plus one factorial tells you you're not skipping numbers in the factorial. This just tells you the end point. Okay? Tells you the end point. So be careful with that. It's all in parentheses in this one. This holds for every value of x. If, it's, if you've seen it before, that means sine is what's called an entire function. Right? It's got infinitely infinite derivatives everywhere. Cosine of x. You can think of this as being built out of odd powers, right? Sine is an odd function. It's no surprise that sine has odd powers. Odd functions, odd polynomial is approximated by odd polynomials. Cosine is an even function, so we expect it to have even powers in its polynomial. In fact, I'll actually write some terms out so you can see what this looks like. This is x minus x to the third over three factorial. So the idea is it's all odd powers of x divided by the corresponding factorial. Cosine is all even powers of x divided by even factorial. And this converges for every value of x. And the last one you absolutely must have memorized. You don't even have to memorize the sigma notation here, but you have to at least have this. You should be able to just produce these on command. And the last one is e to the x. So with e to the x, you're looking at one plus x over one factorial plus x squared over two factorial plus x to the third over three factorial. So on. All the powers of x, all positive, divided by the corresponding factorial. This also converges everywhere. That should actually make you suspicious. These series, by the way. So if you're if you're thinking of if you're looking at this and saying what the, what you might say if you had more time to look at this is what I should say. 
you might notice this is a bunch of odd terms with factorials on the bottom. This is a bunch of even terms with factorials on the bottom. And it seems like there might be a way to add them together so that this comes out because this has every power with the factorial on the bottom, right? So this in some weird way suggests that there's this relationship between all of these guys. So I think in, the, in, a, in an earlier class, I wrote down for you guys the definition. There's no accident here. So why, are, why is e to the x and sine of x and cosine of x so useful when you take derivatives? Why do they replicate themselves? Well, what their power series is showing you is one of the big insights of complex analysis, which is that e to the x is equal to cosine of x a times the sine of x. You may or may not have seen this formula before somewhere. But again, beyond the scope of the class, but one of the central reasons why these things all kind of have the same sort of behavior power series are nice, they all converge everywhere. Why do these derivatives cycle? They cycle because exponentials are built out of sines and cosines, and cosine and sine are built out of exponentials. Just to give you the sort of bigger picture here about like the power series tell you that these things are true. And that these things being true is the whole reason why sines and cosines have re repeating derivatives. So sines and cosines are really secretly just, you can see it here. Take a derivative of this series, what's going to happen? All of these odd power things are going to turn into even power things when you take a derivative. Or sorry, all these even powers are going to turn into odd powers. So the derivative of this is this. Just see it. The four comes down, it hits the four, and the four factorial, which turns it into a three factorial. You drop the power by one. So you can read off the fact that these are derivatives of each other from their power series. Power series reveal all this structure and why these functions are so useful. Okay, you don't care about complex analysis yet because you haven't seen it in the class, you can ignore it, but all of this is sort of deep about why sines and cosines are all over math in science. All right. So which ones should you be familiar with even if you don't have to have them memorized. And like I said, these you should memorize. You should memorize them. The ones you should be familiar with, um, I would argue that it is very useful to be familiar with. And here, I mean, this should be a surprise when you see them written down. You should know. Our series for the natural log of one plus x. This is kind of a strange one, but it's the same sort of pattern. X minus x to the third over three, not factorial, just three, plus x to the fifth over five, minus x to the seventh over seven, so on. Wait, that, that's the same. I'm sorry, I'm mixing my series together. I can't just log, my bad. X, oh my god. To plus x to the third over three minus x to the fourth over four plus x to the fifth over five minus x to the sixth over six and so on. It's one of the obvious patterns you might look up, right? Power divided by the power, power divided by the power, make it alternate so it converges. Three is here is one. And the reason that you have to put this one in here is because the natural log of zero is minus infinity. It doesn't exist. So this series gives you an approximation for natural log that works very well from here to here. That's a standard series, you should know that one. And then uh, the book wants you to know the binomial series, so I guess I should at least tell you what that means. But I really like to, you know what, I'm going to what I want you to do is I want you to read about the binomial series. So I'm going to write down the formula for it, which is this. One plus x to the k is the sum of n equals zero to infinity of k choose n x to the n. And all that means is you start at k and you subtract one a bunch of times, right? 
one plus kx plus k times k minus one over two factorial x squared plus k times k minus one times k minus two over three factorial x to the third. The pattern is easier to see. The pattern is easier to see than, than, than the formula shows. So there's a section in the book on this. This one, if you can get some familiarity with working with it, gives you a really quick way of computing some basic power series without having to do a bunch of derivatives. So how am I going to know that you guys are familiar with this? Um, one what I'm planning to do tomorrow is I'm actually going to bring in a structured worksheet of these problems where one of the examples we work through is going to be this. Okay, so we're not going to be, it's not going to be like 30 problems tomorrow. It's going to be a worksheet that's got three or four questions on it with like steps laid out and then explorations around those steps. So we're going to look at this tomorrow. I'm not just abandoning it to you. All right, so this stuff is dense. Are there questions about anything? Get the theory out of the way. I want to do some more examples. Slowly walk through some examples of how this stuff works, of how we use them. And it's going to presume that we have these in hand already, that we know these. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you how you could use power series to avoid using L'Hopital's rule. Just, you know, L'Hopital's rule kind of pain in the butt sometimes. So here's an old trick. These are Taylor series or power series examples, power series applications, for example. What are these used for? Here's one. I really like this idea. What is the limit? N goes to infinity. Sorry, x goes to infinity. X goes to zero. E to the x minus one minus x over x squared. Why is L'Hopital's rule justified? What's wrong with this limit? But, well, we could, if the, if the top went to a constant, we, we could divide by zero and say that it was infinity, right? But this is zero over zero. This is an indeterminate form. Dividing by zero, if this was like one and this was zero, then it would blow up to infinity. But the top of this also goes to zero, right? Because you get one minus one minus zero on top. And zero on bottom. So this is a zero over zero form. What you guys would have learned in an earlier class was that when you get a zero over zero form, you got to use the L'Hopital's rule to figure it out. So you hit this thing with L'Hopital's rule a couple of times, and uh, that's annoying. The L'Hopital's rule means you got to take derivatives. So instead, we're going to cheese this. We're going to replace e to the x with the power series for e to the x. Some of you may have seen this before. So I'm actually going to do this not by not by L'Hopital's rule, but by thinking of the power series for e to the x as a giant polynomial. This is one of these things that the first time I saw it, I didn't believe it because it just looked like cheating. So e to the x is one plus x plus x squared over two plus x to the third over three plus a bunch of other stuff. Take that power series and subtract one and then subtract x and divide by x squared. Oh, but look, since it's a giant polynomial, one minus one is zero, x minus x is zero. These just cancel. The one here and the one here cancel each other. And the x here and the x here cancel each other because e to the x is its power series. What's left? x squared over two, plus x to the third over three divided by x squared. But oh, but everything left has an x squared inside, so I can just divide. x squared divided by x squared is one. x squared divided by x, or x to the third by x squared is x. So this is just the limit as x goes to zero of distribute, if we break the fraction up is what I'm saying. One half plus x over three plus x to the fourth plus factorial. Or factorial and so on. So I've taken the x squared and I put it here, 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 and that's left, right? And look at that. Through cheesy algebra, 
put in now I can just plug in x equals zero, and the only thing that survives is the one half, so that's the limit. So what do we do here? What we're basically saying is e to the x minus one minus x over x squared as a power series looks like one half plus one over three factorial x plus one over four factorial x to the second and so on. That function and this function are the same just by power series manipulation. So the limit of x goes to zero of this, previously we've had to think about with uh, L'Hopital rule. I can just think of the limit of x goes to zero of this. And that's zero, and that's zero, and every other term is zero, so one half is what survives. This kind of manipulation. So you think of a couple of terms of a function in the power series and then do a power series reduction. This is a standard technique. Why should I have to take derivatives when I can replace with power series? So this is a way of computing indeterminate limits that avoids both rule. Okay. Another easy example, a third proof of this fact. You guys are supposed to know, although many people don't, the engineer is identity, right? Sine x and x are the same thing. You're supposed to know that that limit is one. Why is that limit one? Because sine of x is equal to x minus x to the third over three factorial plus x to the fifth over four factorial and so on. So if I took that and divided it by x, you just get sine of x over x is one. Minus x squared over two factorial plus x to the fourth over five factorial. The x goes and cancels one of the x's out of all those. And what's left behind is a polynomial that when you put zero in, only one comes out. This sort of thinking. As weird as this seems, this is the way that working mathematicians and scientists think about the way functions work in them. This is intrinsically a sort of an order of growth type argument. Replacing a function with a power series lets you do this cheap algebra instead of having to do calculus to find these things. And anytime you can do algebra instead of calculus, that's what the working mathematician, engineer, and scientist prefer. So that's the limits. So that's one of the things that Taylor series are good for. Taylor series allow computation of indeterminate forms without local rule. In some cases, you vastly prefer to do it this way. And the reason is there's functions that have power series that are really easy, but their derivatives are awful. The things with square roots inside of them or fractions of functions will be awful. Often, this is the best way to do it is by thinking in terms of power series. Okay. Our second big application of power series, integrating functions that don't have integrals. Talked a little bit about last night. Find the integral of e to the minus x squared dx. So prior to this class, and this is an example I put it before, I'm going to do it one more time here. Prior to this class, this integral famously is something that doesn't, it doesn't exist. This has no closed form, which means no simple function that I could write down whose derivative is e to the minus x squared. It's not an integral that's possible to do without using power series techniques. Unfortunately, this is also this function, which goes into the name Gaussian or normal distribution 
So it's a great irony that one of the most useful functions in all of mathematics can't be integrated, even though all probability involves finding the area underneath it. But a basic question of probability, if you ever taken statistics and had to compute Z scores, you were just finding the area under this curve, but with a numerical table instead of with an integral because you can't do the integral. So where'd the table come from? It had to come from somewhere. Somebody must have calculated these things. And the answer is, it comes with power series. So, if e to the x, why do I want you to know e to the x? Because if you know e to the x, then you know you can put anything you want in up here. Not going to change the infinite, infinite radius of convergence, right? It's already way b1. So if I want to integrate e to the minus x squared, I need a power series for e to the minus x squared. But since I carry around permanently and for the rest of my life the power series for e to the x, if I want to know what e to the minus x squared is, I just put it in the box. E to the minus x squared must be the sum from n equals zero to infinity of minus x squared to the n over n factorial. The power series for e to the x can be substituted into or composed into just like the one for one over one minus x. So knowing a power series for a function lets you build power series for new functions, just like with one over one minus x. Sorry, I'm trying to be that. It's entertaining as possible <laughs> here. Sorry, we're teaching this, teaching this stuff. You guys should try it sometime. All right. Um, right. So if you write it out as a power series so you can integrate it, because that's what we're going to do, I have to put the n in here with the two, and I want to split out the minus one. That makes sense? This is algebraically manipulated. So we got this formula by plugging into that one. And now I've just taken the minus x squared to the n and I put the n onto the negative one and the n onto the x squared. And I get that series. Okay, that's the best, that's the closest we could do. And z to the minus x squared is that. And it is that everywhere. So if I want to integrate e to the minus x squared, not the best I can do. Is to integrate its power series. And you really want to do this in sigma notation so you only have to integrate once. One time I want to integrate. So the power rule says, and don't get confused here, right? So I, I've seen in the homework already that a couple of people, when you start dealing with integrating and differentiating power series, there's only one object in here that's being worked on. Everything else is a constant. So it's literally only ever the power rule if you do it right. I mean, people are taking like quotient rules of things, like these nightmares of algebra, which were technically correct, but like the quotient rule should be avoided at all costs. So to integrate this, you increase the power by one and divide by the new power. Standard. Power rule stuff minus one to the n over. Okay, increase the power by one and divide by the new power. This dude right here. Oh, sorry. That's this calculus too. I would have put a lot of point, right? There. Now we're better. But this guy right here is the best you can do. This is the this is the answer to what is the integral of e to the minus x squared. And because it's annoying, I have to write this down over. There's no closed form for this. So when mathematicians do it, when they have to say like, oh, that power series, this is that power series. We just give it a name so we never have to write it again. It's called birth. Earth of x. Seriously, it's a super important function. After all, like finding the area under this thing is important, right? Irv of x, the integral from minus infinity to x, e to the minus e squared dt. 
It's literally just the thing, but we don't want to do the work, so we just call it something else. ERF stands for error function. Extremely commonly used in the sciences, in mathematics, because it's just calculating the area. It's actually what it's really doing. If you've seen it in statistics, it's it's giving you the cumulative distribution of the of, of the belt. The Garrett computed a Z score in your life. That table came from that series. And actually, it turns out most functions, most of them, almost every function that you could possibly write down of interest does not have an integral. So being able to work like this is really important. So like some of the most basic uh, functions that show up like in optics, for example, only have power series representations. And then you just cheat and say, oh, well, I'm never going to write that again. I'm just write Earth now, which also has a new variable table where you calculate the new Earth. Okay, so that's almost enough to get through um, the derivation of the Quarren series and Taylor series that you see in here. The one question that you do not have yet is there's a question about the binomial series in here on the homework, which is question um, question nine, but we're going to talk about that tomorrow on the worksheet. So we're going to do a derivation of like the binomial series and what it's good for. Um, other than that, what you have to be able to do with the Taylor series, and this is a good uh, stopping point, is what do I want you to be able to do? So you should be able to do the following. You should be able to derive uh, a Taylor series from the definition. You should be able to integrate and differentiate one. You should be able to compute limits the series. The indeterminate limits in the way we, 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 we did before. But, and then for the sort of bigger thing we already know from power series is to get new Taylor series from old ones by plugging in. New series from old. These questions are the sort of things that I'm interested in asking you guys. Coupled with the condition that those four series I told you to memorize, that you have those in your head e to the x, sine x, cosine x, and one over one minus x. Okay. All right. I know this is a lot. I know we're going to slow down a little bit tomorrow. We have a structured worksheet where we're going to talk about power series and working with power series in this context. You guys have been really good about your homework. Um, if there are questions that you would like to see on that sheet, just contact me if there's something you're having trouble with, and I will add it to the sheet. Okay. All right. Keep it up. Keep it up. I know. I know. This is a tough one. Keep it up. Thank you. Yep.